Okay, seizures and syncope. Uh, this is some extra stuff I put down. This is trivia stuff. I just thought it was neat as I was looking up this, this seizure type of thing because the fact that a seizure is when essentially these these firings of these neurons go go bizarre. I mean, they fire a certain rate and a hertz, and they fire and they fire very fast. And a seizure is essentially, like it says, it's just this random continuing impulses of the brain. They start to fire. They actually start to misfire. Uh, I've used this analogy I, all the time, really, in the first year, but. I use it again. Remember the, the is it bug, bug slot? <coughs> the ants? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so bug slot. In, in the first part of bug slot, the, the bugs are carrying their uh, their gift, the forced gift, the hopper, the big uh, grasshopper, right? And they all have it above their head and they're walking in line. And then they have these guys with the little white helmets on them outside directing them and keeping them all in line, right? And then all of a sudden, I mean, they're all in line. Everything's working good. And then Flip decides he's going to try to invent something to uh, speed up the process and makes a mess out of it because he knocks the pile down. Okay, when he knocks the pile down, all the ants go berserk. They go everywhere. They get out of their little straight line. They start going everywhere, all right? That's the seizure, okay? And what the body does is it gets this back in line, right? Back in homeostasis. So those little ants with the white hats, they're sitting over there going, it's okay. It's okay. Because uh, Flick knocks that leaf off, and now the leaf is in the middle of everything, and they can't walk in a straight line. So... Uh, those guys with the little, the ants with the little white hats go, it's okay, it's okay. Get back in line. We'll walk around the leaf. And so the, the, <laughs> the uh, ants get back in line. It takes time, okay, which is part of the seizure portion of this, okay. It takes time. There's a state of post-ictal, post-pictal state, okay. We're in recovery state, and so the ants walk around the leaf, and they get all back in line, and everything's good, okay? And so it, there's a misfiring. There's this sort of misfiring of these neurons, and it's a mystery. If you talk to a lot of neurologists, they will tell you these are reasons some seizures take, seizures take place, but they really don't know. It's, it's, it's really an one of those question mark type of events. Anyway, for trivia, 268 uh, miles per hour, which these these neurons fire along these axes, okay? I thought that was pretty neat trivia. These neuron cells in the brain, a hundred billion something. Let me put that where I can't step on it. hundred billion neurons Okay? And they fire 200 times per second, which is, I mean, just, and if you think about it, you think about the brain, I mean, you guys can tell the brain, and so uh, that and water and a bunch of neurons, okay, neural pathways that you can't see. So very fast, and whatever number that is, okay, <laughs> I wish that was the number of my bank account. <coughs> I wouldn't be here. I'd be swinging a golf club in the Caymans every day. Okay? But bits of information transmitted per second. That's a lot of information every second. The brain is highly complicated. Okay? And this is one of the reasons they can't really figure out this. A lot of times these seizure events, they just don't know what... I mean, they can treat it, and then they can speculate a lot of times, but sometimes they just don't know what causes it. All right. So, a temporary alteration of these firing of these neurons, all right, it does change the mental aspect of it. Later we'll look at this, uh, like in a uh, typical 
what they're calling motor seizure now, or what we used to call grand mal, M-A-L, not grand mal, but M-A-L, grand mal seizure. There was no uh, ability to recognize or follow uh, simple commands. Okay? And then they can result into trauma. A seizure associated with trauma is critical. Uh, that's a level one trauma uh, transport. And then you have the medical conditions that we'll, we'll go into. So these unprovoked or primary seizures, uh, sometimes they're unknown. They involve both hemispheres. So when you see partial hemorrhage, uh, complete these different names for this it, it involves the hemisphere of the brain so you have a simple partial seizure one hemisphere com complex partial seizure so the things that are taking place in the body it depends on what area of the brain is affected okay so you have other provoked seizures that uh they, they do have an underlying cause, some don't have an underlying cause, and we'll go through a list in just a minute. So there's a list of reasons, high fever, a febrile seizure, a lot. This comes in uh, infants a lot, it's very common in, in babies, but also in uh, adults, like someone that's septic, that has a high fever, they could have a seizure from it. They're non-compliant with their medication. This happens a lot. Not just that they're not compliant, but they get, uh, what's the word when you get used to the medication dose? Like tolerance. Yeah, the tolerance. They build up a tolerance to it, and then they have to go get their levels checked, okay, of that medication. They may have to take more medication. They built up sort of a tolerance to it. Infections, sepsis, like we talked about, poisonings, the, you know, the big one everybody always talks about in the EMS world is organic phosphate poisonings. They can cause seizures to happen. That's why you don't walk through clear liquid on the ground at a, a scene, an accident scene. Organic phosphate is uh, fertilizer. Okay, so diabetic emergencies, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia. They could have some sort of insult to the brain where they're having problems with it. It go into shock. So, I mean, there's there's a list of reasons behind this. I mean, these are all listed out in your book as well. Uh, hypoxia, you have a stroke. Obviously, drug or alcohol withdrawal that uh, causes a seizure is life-threatening. That, that, uh, that doper that's having seizures due to the fact that they can't get their fix, it's, it's life-threatening for that person. That's at the end of their, their life, okay? Cardiac dysrhythmias, high blood pressure, pregnancy, we'll get into that. We'll talk about eclampsia, uh, pre-eclampsia, which is the high blood pressure part. And then eclampsia is the seizure. Sodium, potassium, electrolyte imbalances. You get too hot, again, temperature. Even hyperthermic, like an environmental type thing, you're outside in the in North Texas, working to death in the heat, in the middle of summer, have a seizure, uh, hyperthermia, and then idiopathic, they just don't know. They don't know why the person's having the seizure. A lot, and, and that's the case a lot of times, they just don't, we just don't really know. Uh, I mean, they do all the tests and they just can't find out the reasons why. The same as asthma, you have status asthmaticus, okay? You have status epilepticus, thank you, Latin. Uh, and these are seizures that are long-lasting, or there's no, there's one seizure after another with no postictal time, okay? Where there's no time of rest in between. So they have the seizure, a very short part in between, they have another seizure, okay? And these are life-threatening. One thing about a seizure, is that the patient is not breathing very well, if at all, during the seizure. So here, we, during this status epilepticus, a multiple seizure event, we may have to put an airway in, or like an NPA. Remember, they're clenched together, usually, in the teeth. We might have to put an NPA in and ventilate them. They're having one seizure after another. 
Uh, they get severely hypoxic, right? Start having cardiac dysrhythmia from it. So this is life-threatening just to, to the fact that, hey, they're not ventilating very well. They're not getting, they're not breathing very well, okay? So status epilepticus, one seizure sort of can, after another, uh, without any sort of responsiveness. Okay. And the thing about it is, in all these seizures, you probably want to consider ALS, because BLS-wise, you don't carry the medicine that can stop the seizure, okay? And even ALS, the medicine like Versed or Valium or something that can stop the seizure, it doesn't necessarily stop the seizure up here, okay? It stops the muscle movement. So the patient still could be seizing inside, which nobody can see unless you hook them to a machine, okay? But they, they may, uh, at least it'll stop the, the shaking tonic-clonic type action. And then, like I said, types of seizures, tonic-clonic, this is what I call them all the time. Uh, like I said, there's this older thing called a grand mal, M-A-L, uh, seizure. I, my use is, a, I just call them a tonic-clonic, because that's the, the way that the muscles move, okay, and relax. But another term is a generalized onset motor seizure that you'll see. Okay, so, but uh, that's too long. I call them a tonic clonic, and then I don't call them a grand mal seizure because I go texting and every once in a while I just say grand mal, and then you know how that goes. Everybody talks bad about me. All right, so during the tonic clonic seizure or generalized seizure, uh, it involves the him, uh, the reticular, reticular activating system. Okay, what does that do? What does this system do here, the reticular activating system or the RAS? Do you remember that? Hmm? I'm trying to remember you talking about this. Remember what that controls? Oh, it's that? The RAS. What's that control? Everybody's RAS is functioning right now. Not awake, but being conscious. Conscious. conscious, right. There's a difference between being awake and conscious, okay? So the reticular activating system is the system deep in the brain that uh, promotes consciousness, okay? So it, it affects that. So here, the patient's not awake or aware of what's taking place. People will fake seizures all the time for a number of different reasons. Sometimes they fake seizures for, you know, to get the sympathy pill. Maybe they had a fight with their husband or wife, right? They fake a little seizure, okay? I've seen kids fake seizures to get out of their home. <laughs> no, I keep going there, but this whole report card thing, they fake a little seizure, okay? I've seen people fake seizures to get out of paying their bill at the restaurant. Okay, so they, they fake a lot of seizures. So one of the things I do is I bend down over them and I ask them, are you having a seizure? Because even the ones that are bad at faking, and you may have seen these in the hospital, a lot of times if you catch them off guard, they'll open their eyes and look at you or they'll stop. The, the rookies, I say, I bend over and you know, you just raise your voice just a little so to kind of startle them. And I bend over and say, are you having a seizure? And the rookies will, yes. And they respond to you. You can't respond during a tonic clonic seizure, so they're faking it. So the game is over. All right. So they, if, if they can res in in a tonic clonic seizure, if they can respond to you, they're not having a seizure. Now there's other type of seizures which they can respond to you. Okay, but those seizures are not involving the stiffening and jerking of the muscles like a tonic clonic. Okay, the tonic. It's the stiffening of the muscles, temporary stiffening, and the clonic is the, the jerking or the contraction of the muscles, okay? So they, they, they are not aware there if they can uh, <coughs> respond to you. So they, they do come in stages, okay? How do you say this? Aura with an A? Yeah. So they get a sense of it. 
Uh, if this patient has a history of seizures, okay, and they, they get this, and they, it, it could be that, or it could be a deja vu, so like, oh, I've been here before, I think. And so if that was me, let's say I had a history of seizures, which I don't, okay, but if I get this aura, or this deja vu, I'll probably lay down on this soft mat because I think I'm about to have a seizure, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and lay down, right? So, so I don't fall down, right? And uh, so you get, there is a loss of consciousness because the RAS is involved. There's a tonic phase, which is the muscle rigidity we just spoke of, and a clonic phase, and then a hypertonic phase, which they're, they're stiffening and they're doing both. Okay, I believe that's what that is. And uh, then there's always, always a postictal phase, postictal phase. Sometimes there's a dash in there where people say postictal or postictal, but postictal I think is whatever the word is, how they pronounce it. But this resting phase, the body just went through this a lot of muscle contraction, a lot of work. So it's this resting phase, this recuperation phase, okay? This phase could last between five and 30 minutes. I've had a 30 minute transport before and the patient has been post the whole way. They may, they may not respond to you. Uh, a lot of times they might just look over to one side. They might just stare sort of like they're staring into space, okay? Uh, Sometimes they will try to communicate with you, but they can't get the words out. If, have you ever seen that when someone's trying to communicate? And you can tell they're trying to talk to you, but the words aren't coming out. Uh, they do that. They're trying to communicate with you, okay? Uh, but they're just not. It's sort of a resting phase, postictal phase here, but they always have this postictal phase. If you some, have someone, they fall on the ground, they start shaking like a fish, and they stop and they jump right back up and ooh, I had a seizure. No, no, no postictal phase. You know, uh, in this generalized or tonic clonic seizure, these are the stages that they're going to have. Okay. Other things that you look for is uh, loss of uh, bladder, bowel control. Usually they will urinate on themselves, so that's a giveaway. And the patient, when you, when you form that good general first impression, you're gonna look at them and go, yeah, something took place here. Because they'll be diaphoretic, you can tell, right? Be, they're, they're not alert and oriented quite, quite yet. Even as they come out of this postictal phase, they're not, they're, their orientation takes time. Right? So uh, these are just these phases, it's the tonic-clonic seizure. And uh, some pictures, but and it's not a. Uh, have you guys seen a seizure yet in the hospital or around? Yeah, the it's not a like you take a goldfish out, throw them on the ground, and they flop everywhere, right? That's not the the seizure. It's a stiffening and a contraction. These guys contract. Some of them they do move quite a bit, but it's not a a flailing type movement. Because the muscles are, those neurons are firing, so those muscles are contracting, right? So they contract in. It's almost like you're getting shot. So if you, if you think I had some voltage, and every time that, let's say the voltage is on the end of the stick, and I go, right, touch this, touch you with the voltage, you go, like that, right? At least you've seen that on TV, maybe. That'd be a good Halloween trick. <laughs> right? So those muscles are contracting, so it's sort of a contraction type thing, not a flailing event, okay? Uh, it's, it's sort of a rigid, the, the movements are rigid. And then she looks like she's, well, she's probably this aura right here, but this as well, as, this is the way that they would look post -dictal. Like if I came up on this patient here, all right, and I would think maybe she was postictal, okay, if it was if it was a seizure call. Then I'd look for the other things, like urinary incontinence. Uh, 
look for medication as bystanders because if she's this post you're not getting anything out of this, the patient so you try to get it out of bystanders one important thing is how long did the seizure last what were the movements what did she do during the seizure okay someone truly having a seizure they won't remember it what will happen is this person will come out of their post state perhaps okay and look up and see EMS there and they go I must have had a seizure you know you ask them did you have a seizure they say I must have you're here right so uh, that's they don't really remember the event <coughs> So, tonic tonic, follow your protocol, protect the, the patient, okay, from, from harm. If the patient's actively <coughs> seizing, okay, then move, move things out of the way, okay? This is a big open space here because I, I could have a seizure here, you know, but if we were in tight court, like if I was over here, <coughs> have my feet, move, move things out of the way. Don't hold the seizure patient down by any means and never put anything in their mouth. That's so old school, that mess. Never put anything in their mouth. It just becomes an airway obstruction. Don't hold them down, let them seize. Protect their airway. If their head is jerking, don't let them hit the concrete floor, right? Try to hold their airway open a little bit. If the seizure <coughs> continues, then you're gonna to have to start maybe oxygenating them, ventilating them, considering that, uh, NPA and doing some ventilation. Uh, a lot of these patients refuse treatment. More refuse treatment than actually go. I think, if I had to think about it a little bit. So you have this patient that has a history of seizures. They have a seizure for some reason, okay? And they, be, they get through their postictal state and they become A and O times four, all right? They have the right to refuse treatment, and most of them do. They say, oh, I forgot to take my medication, or oh, I'll, I'll call the doc and get my labs drawn again and, and check my labs, okay? They're used to this. Just like that, when we talk about hypoglycemia in a, in a few days, it's the same thing. Most of those patients are, you know, hypoglycemic, you get out there and you wake them back up, they don't go. They, they refuse transport because they're used to the to what's taking place but uh, if they're this patient and she looks like she's not a and o times too much but if they're altered altered mental status in any form then they have to go right you treat them under what type of consent right. implied consent they have to go if they're not a and o times 40 or loved oriented, they have to go to the hospital, okay? Uh, and then what else would you do to this patient with altered mental status? Very good, these stick all the time. To rule out hypoglycemia. Seizures can be quite the emergency. Most of the time, they only last a few seconds or a few minutes, the time that an ambulance gets to the location, they're done seizing and they're in this post state. Okay, they've already had their seizure. Uh, so it, it doesn't last typically that long. With, yeah. Within this post uh, I can't say, uh, like, will they be able to like, move around, like actually stand up or like look around? Oh, in the post state? Mm -hmm. No, usually not. They're, they're going to. You're, they're going to need help moving. I mean, they're not going to be post up walking around. They're going to be altered where they're usually sitting on the ground, laying in the bed, whatever, and you, you're going to have to move them. Like, will we, like, have to put them on stretcher and carry them to the ambulance, or do we have, like, just assist moving them to the ambulance? Well, you always put them on the stretcher and take the stretcher to the ambulance. I'm not sure what you're asking. You load the patient, let's say they're on the floor. You, you take the patient off the floor, put them on your stretcher, and take them to the ambulance. Okay. Yeah. 
no, I, I see your point. EMS, uh, it's a liability to have the patient walk to the ambulance. Mm. They have before for everybody, but uh, most of the time the patient is put on the uh, stretcher for their safety and they are transported into the ED on the stretcher most of all the time. Okay, very rarely uh, do you not transport the patient on the stretcher. Some some agencies, that's an event that you would probably get, you could get fired over. Or definitely suspended. There's a list of just generalized seizures and uh, absence seizures. So these are real sudden grief loss of consciousness, okay, uh, they might just be staring sort of in, into the, uh, I mean, sort of like they're daydreaming. Uh, it used to be called petty mall seizures, but uh, they, they sort of changed the names around a little bit. So they may just be staring off into space here. Myoclonic seizure, Sort of a series of jerks and contractions, okay. And now, these these type of things, it's not a it's not a uh, tonic clonic seizure. They're just jerking and, and contracting, okay. So they're able to communicate with you. That's the big difference. These patients are able to communicate. All right. Uh, tonic seizures, where they uh, suddenly stiffen up, they just go through the tonic phase, not the clonic phase. Am I good? Tonic. Stiffening, clonic, and jerking, right? So you can, you can have clonic seizures or tonic seizures. Usually they're both tonic, clonic. All right. Atonic seizures are these drop seizures. So you're sitting in the in the chair and you have a drop seizure. You you just fall over. And it's just very brief and, and temporary. Okay. Uh, some of them. Like the video we saw last year, they were holding a cup and they, they have a little drop seizure. They drop the cup and all right, uh, they drop what they're holding or they fall out of the chair. And they usually don't last that long, very short in, in length, okay? And then, of course, feed-off seizures, the sudden spike in temperature, it's usually associated with infection, but it's also associated around pediatrics. So, like, all the moms, new moms do in the winter time, they dress their kids up in all these really hot clothes to keep them, keep them warm, and they're having a seizure, they're having a febrile seizure. So what would you do? Just take the clothes off. Yeah, you take the clothes off. You, you take them, cool them down. Not aggressively, we'll learn the difference later. You just take the clothes off and let them protect their airway, and then uh, let them seize. It, it won't last very long, okay? And it's very common. They, it is an emergency. They, they need to go to the hospital because they, they, they probably have, have some sort of infection, right? And then we move to the partial seizures, simple partial seizures. They have all these different names, okay? Uh, here's the big difference. It's awake and aware, all right? I've seen, and, and like I said, we used to call them just petty malls. We grouped them all in one big group, but these these type of seizures, I've seen patients have them for eight to ten hours, and they, they're they running down through their medicine routine and trying to get these to stop, and they can't get them to stop, and then they go to the hospital. These are well-documented seizures. The patient has a history of them. They'll tell you, usually you'll see the medication that they take. Uh, there's a list coming up here in a minute of the different types of medication. You don't need to memorize that by any means, but just be aware. All right. Now with the technology, if you pick up a pill bottle, you're not really sure what it is, you can just look at the number. I don't even Google that number and it'll tell you. You guys are quick with the phones. You can type with your thumbs and type that name in and it, it will pop up what type of medication it is. So even if the patient's still postictal and they're sort of altered, you see the medications, you can look at their medications, oh, they're seizure medication. So they could have had a seizure, right? But these partial seizures, 
they uh, the patient is awake and alert. That's that's the difference. Then a tonic clinic where they're not awake and alert. Uh, and then again, some more just different as they break them down into different ones. The motor seizures, like we talked about, the grand mal seizures or the tonic clinic, uh, sensory seizures. Uh, they have this aura. Why don't they spell that with an O? They don't call it aura, huh? <clears throat> but the uh, aura, and uh, they're autonomic, where they just get these different signs and symptoms: discomfort, nausea, the the vomiting. All right. Not so much these these things that you're going to see. This this patient is going to be able to tell you, hey. These are the type of seizures that I have. And, and you just have to sort of believe them. That they're doing psychic, psychogenic uh, seizures, emotional changes, fear, anxiety can produce a seizure. they saying that, that a lot of things can produce a seizure. Anybody have a seizure disorder here? You want to talk about it? Yeah, but, I didn't write that in there. Seizure disorder. Yeah. But uh, video games can produce seizures because of the flashing, the different changes. Back in my day, the video, there was no all this changing in colors and flashing and everything else. It can promote seizures, okay? Cartoons, the new cartoons can promote seizures. The different flashing and different things. And the thing that you have to remember is, Anybody, any time, can have a seizure. Okay, it just takes something to sort of trigger that. All right, and then this person could have a seizure. If you have a history of seizures, then it's not a big deal, really. A person without a history of seizures, it's a bigger deal. That's a, you need to go to the hospital if you have a seizure and you don't have a history of seizures or. If you get there's a traumatic event associated with it, okay, that person definitely needs to go to the hospital. Otherwise, like we said before, these guys may uh, just refuse transport. And then we want to talk about the partial seizure. Okay, they're awake, but they're not really aware of what's taking place. They sort of blank stare, uh, repetitive sometimes. Sometimes they're silent. One that seen is this lady she would stare off and just like I'm rambling on now okay all of a sudden she would stop she just and then she just pick up right where she left off uh, after like 15 minutes they go sit her down and she just and then she pick up right where she left off one thing that you can't do with a seizure disorder is what? What's one activity you should not do? Drive. <laughs> exactly. You should not drive with a seizure disorder because you're not sure when you're going to have a seizure. Okay? You can't work in EMS as well with a seizure disorder. Uh, you could have a seizure in the back of the ambulance, which has happened before. Not the patient, but the person in the back, the EMS personnel, have a seizure. Okay. Huh? Yeah, but the patient sort of freaks out. Oh. <laughs> yeah. The patient's looking over at him. The story goes, it wasn't me, but the story goes is that they got to the hospital, they opened the back of the ambulance. The, the paramedic was in the wheel well on the side of the door, supposed to take on the patient, was like, <laughs> you know, looking over at him. But uh, that, would, that would be funny. But so, it's not that important to really break down what type of seizure out of all of these, okay? It's to, just like almost all these medical emergencies, you treat the signs and symptoms, okay? So you always control the airway, provide support for the airway. You always do a good patient assessment with every intervention, right? So uh, these are things that takes place. You're breaking it down into to the different kinds, it's just an academic thing. It's not really a treatment thing that we would do.
And then uh, generalized seizures, they have the tonic clonic seizures like we've been talking about the whole time there. So just like we said, size up, you're getting there, you're sort of you're facing a size up, it's this trauma, is it poison, especially if you gotta make sure the scene is safe. Is it safe for me to be there, right? Med is it medical? Is it trauma? Uh, it, are they postictal? Are they actively seizing? Make sure you protect them, okay? Uh, this seizure could precede a cardiac arrest most all the time. If a witness cardiac arrest, the patient will look like they're seizing, okay? It's, it's very brief, but I can, if you're sitting there and all of a sudden they start, they, they, they draw up and they sort of start seizing and they, they just become unconscious, suspect cardiac arrest. Check that pulse, okay? I've seen that a number of times. There's, there's, uh, they, they seize and they're in deep fib. Most all the time they were in deep fib. So we, in, you're right there, you're wit you witnessed it, so it'd be good to get that AU training, right? Shock them, save their life. But so that, that, that can take place. So do a good size up. All right, move the stuff out of the way, protect them, protect their airway, protect them from harming themselves, protect bystanders from harming them, okay? Uh, here, I've witnessed, a few, where I've been around a few seizures where the teachers are laying on top of the patient to stop them from shaking so much, you know, and you say, get, get, get off of them, you know, what are you doing? You know, they want to try to put something in their mouth or, or something like that. A lot of times you have to protect the patient from the people around them. Uh, so, uh, for, but definitely protect the patient. All right. Always do a good assessment. Their ABCs. Oxygenate them if if indicated. Remember, evaluate the need for oxygen transport. Priority. Why a, why a priority transport for this seizure patient? We don't know what causes. Hmm? We don't know what causes. Okay. You don't know what caused it. Cause could be unknown. What else? Uh, you have this patient you're transporting. They had a seizure. Now they're postictal. Why? When do you want to sort of make that a priority transport at, at a BLS? BLS. You and your EMT partner. Uh, Yeah. yeah, but don't. Yeah, that's true. But don't overthink it. Think simple. Kiss, kiss principle. So you have one seizure. It could be normal for them. Oh, you're trying to make sure that they don't have any, they don't have like consecutive seizures. Yeah, they could start having one seizure after another. Okay. Did you say that? Yeah, it's okay. Well, yeah, okay. I didn't hear you. I give you credit. Take credit away from credit. Yeah, it's okay. So you could go into the status epilepticus mode, right? You could start having multiple seizures, and all of a sudden you can't stop them. Now you can't ventilate them very, you know, very well. Okay, so it could be life-threatening. So you never know when what's going to precipitate another seizure. Okay. They're, they're going to stop, so it, it could be life-threatening. ALS-wise, not so much because we can control the seizure and we can control the airway better than on the BLS side, right? I can give them some dope to stop the seizure, and I can put a tube in them if they stop breathing. So the uh, on the BLS side, not so much. So make that sort of a uh, priority. You can suction, so there will be secretions. They bite their tongue, right? They can't swallow their tongue. Why? Yeah, it's attached. You know, that's why we don't put things in their mouth. Way, way back in the day, uh, they, I mean, they put all kinds of things. The acceptable medical practice taped up by the bed in every ED room was a bite bar. It was this plastic little piece of plastic about this long that they put in the mouth to feed the patients to help protect their airway. And it, it was 
just a airway obstruction, what it was. We learned later, okay? But uh, I've heard of people putting spoons in people's mouths because they think they swallow their tongue, but they don't. Unconscious person, the tongue becomes flaccid and falls over the epiglottis, right? They didn't swallow it, it just becomes flaccid. But don't ever put anything in their mouth, especially these. Oh. Bite them off. I've had a patient seizure. I had a patient seize while while I was intubating the patient. He bit down on my laryngoscope blade, and I picked his thorax up. I picked him up off the bed and shook him a little bit to try to get my blade out of his mouth. He bit down on my blade and wouldn't let go. He was having a seizure. I'm like, and uh, he, it wouldn't come out until he stopped seizing. So think about if they bite that metal blade, think about what they're doing to these. You'd come up like this. <laughs> then you're like suction your finger out of his mouth or something, okay? No, they bite these clean off. So you never, never put your finger in their mouth. They, they can bite. Someone that's hypoxic can have a seizure. Do you have your finger in their mouth? Not nah, just it's just pull pull the piece out and keep it. You know, you know. Uh, they and they can they can severely bite their tongue. Okay. They then they and they can have uh, blood vomitus and a lot of secretions in there. Okay. They'll stop seizing when they, their pulse stops. If they go into cardiac arrest, the, that brain function will will stop. Of course, you need to start by compression, huh? Yeah. We, we want to stop that more naturally than death. Yeah. So, these are, if the patient remains unresponsive, that's a problem. You know, if you can't get control of the airway, like we talked about, they're having one seizure after another, these are big things. These are life-threatening things here. Eclampsia. Uh, they're having seizures during pregnancy. Remember, there's two patients. All right. Diabetes, hypo, hypoglycemic. Uh, this, these are all ALS type things that you request ALS for or trauma. Water's a problem. They start seizing in the water. Okay. You you have you have a couple issues. One. You have a water rescue, okay? That may not be you, the person that does do the water rescues, okay? Those are other people who are trained in that event to do the water rescue. Uh, we'll get into that when we get into some sort of environmental type things. But you never jump into a pool or a body of water to try to rescue somebody, okay? And I say never say never. I mean, your family or whatever. But uh, you, you probably take the fun, but uh, because they will, if you're not trained in that, they're drowning. That person having that event will use you as a cork and drown you. There's a there's a technique of doing that. And so if you're untrained, like in just about anything, if you're not trained in hazard, hazmat, hazardous material, don't go in there, okay? If you're not trained in water rescue, don't be quick to do that. We'll, we'll have some time to, to look at that. Right. Okay, is there trauma? Is there evidence of trauma? There's no history of epilepsy or seizure disorder. You know, you walk in their house and, you know, you can tell they're alcoholic, really clean alcoholic. There's going to be empty bottles laying around. Okay. Uh, there's no ability there and, and look, look for these different things. Is there evidence of that? I've never been into someone that uh, that had a problem with alcohol, I mean, a serious like alcoholic, that there hasn't been empty booze bottles laying around. They keep them as trophies. <laughs> All right, so there's there's always evidence, evidence of needles. Uh, I'm not stereotyping people, sorta, but junkies leave their needles laying around if they need another one. Alcoholics leave their booze bottles laying around. There's there's a lot of evidence when when you go in their house. Plus, they're not very tidy people. Uh, I'm not saying every 
alcoholics are untidy, but the majority of them are. You can see it in their house and the way that they they live. And I'm not bagging on them. I'm just saying that these are just observations that you that you have. Okay. Always assess for trauma. Do they have weakness or paralysis? What could this be? They have hemi paralysis. Yeah, it's usually caused by a stroke. Stroke. Yeah. They can have a stroke, right? So that would that would change your transport consideration, perhaps. Okay. And then the extrem the extremities. Do they have evidence that they fail? You know. Yeah. Always assess their vital signs. Uh, they're critical, which I would say five every five minutes. Start looking at those trends, reassessing those vital signs. Uh, the heart rate is the thing that's going to change the most. There, the blood pressure won't really change that much. Definitely, respiratory rate. Check that SPF glucose level, D stick, and then consider ALS. You know, do is this a, is this going to be an ALS problem? And then good history, right? And then transport uh, get as much history always as you can for the as you hand off into the hospital staff here's a laundry list of medications for these patients that have seizures like I said you don't have to memorize these just be familiar with them so as you look at these different medications uh, diazepam or a Valium this is a Valium See the different, the classes here? You can, you can put them in different classes of drugs. That usually helps. Um, Tegretol is a big medication, a seizure medication, okay? And then, I mean, there's... Lorazepam, which is the same as, uh, it's, a, it's a benzodiazepine. It's the same as a class as a Valium. Phenobarbital is a big popular one as well. Fentanyl, I mean not fentanyl. Uh, Dilantin is uh, a big seizure, common seizure medication. And like if they take dilantin, they have the seizures, they'll go in and do a dilantin level. They'll check that level, that medication in the in, in, in the labs. Make sure it's uh do they what what word did you use? Uh they build a tolerance to it. Okay. Again, looking for these sets of uh sputum. Bleeding, bleeding from the mouth, bitten tongue. Yeah. Urinary. You know, I've I've never seen anyone lose their bowel. They never have food on themselves from a seizure. But almost all the true seizures, tonic conic seizures, they've had urinary incontinence. They've always urinated on themselves. That was the the give me one. That, uh, okay, but I've had people who fake purposely urinate on themselves so that they, they, they want the drug, right? See, a, a lot of these drugs here, especially these benzos, that benzodiazepines that I talked about, they give you a really nice high. So people fake these seizures for the drug medication so they can get the high. All the time. It's not unfaithful. So Tachycardia, so that person says postictal, they're they're be tachycardic, the tachnia, and they lose, lose really fast breathing, and then they'll have this confusion to them. And a lot of this you can see. Uh, once you've seen a real seizure, okay, tonic clonic seizure, and you've seen a fake one, you'll be able to tell the difference okay, as you go down. It's sad that they do, they, they fake a lot of seizures. You have to be you, there's sort of a system that you go through to see if you're faking it. But, uh, 
That's not our primary concern. Our primary concern is taking care of the patient, though, right? Patient care. And just like I said, position them. If they're unconscious or semi-unconscious, put them in a, a lateral recumbent position, okay? Watch their airway. May need for suctioning, like we talked about. They may need an NPA. They may need to be ventilated, bag valve bound. Evaluate the need for oxygen, transport them. Okay. Always reassess. And then uh, there's, there's medicines, like I said, the benzodiazepine. My protocol, we gave Versed. We used to have Valium. Valium is sort of an old drug. Uh, Versed is a much better drug to give for seizures, okay? So we give them some Versed, and it's, it stops that whole, the, the jerking portion of it anyway. Just out of trivia, if you give them ALS flashes, if you give them the medication that, and they stop the, the clonic part of this, okay, and they're still tachycardic, they're probably still having a seizure, but there's nothing that we can do for it. So, see, just another need to watch watch that rate. All right. And then there's, just be aware that, you know, your, your protocols, uh, open the airway, op here, you know, providing airway support. All right. Remember, they're clenched down, so you're not going to be able to get an OPA in there. Even if they're clenched down, you can suction. You can suction through the nose, okay? Start ventilate, ventilating them if, they're, if they don't stop seizing or they need, they need ventilation. Talk about that, that. And then always, especially if they're lasting two or more seizures, if they're, if they're long seizures, okay? And then, as we talked about, reassess every, every five minutes. Pretty easy to take care of. They, they really are. Seizures are not a big deal to take. Care of. All right, right quick. Almost finished. A couple minutes. Syncope, fainting. There's a so many things that could cause fainting. There's a syncope. Okay, you uh, hypoglycemia. Those okay. So what you would do with the syncope episode is uh, if you know. Increased parasympathetic, you know, decrease in uh, heart rate. You know, uh, increased parasympathetic tone will cause a decrease in heart rate. Increased sympathetic tone will cause what? Increase in heart rate. So if their heart rate goes, their heart rate drops too low. Why do they pass out if their heart rate goes too low? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Okay. Yeah, they're not getting enough oxygen, but why are they not getting enough oxygen? Oh, cardiac output. Cardiac output. It drops cardiac output, right? If their heart rate is how how we how do we uh, get cardiac output? Strong heart rate. Strong heart rate, right? You decrease heart rate affects stroke volume. Stroke volume affects cardiac output, right? Mm -hmm. You can almost do a mathematical thing with it. So uh, if they if they have a heart rate of 30, oh. then there's not going to be enough cardiac output to keep them conscious, perhaps, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, they could seize a little bit when you pass out, okay? Uh, you get up too fast from the chair. You know, all of a sudden you see stars <laughs> and then see ground, right? <laughs> Orthostatic hypotension, you got up too fast, don't get up so fast, okay? Self-eliminating, okay? Could, t could take place there. I mean, the, it's endless on why, why people have these thinkable episodes. What you want to do as a provider is think worst to least, okay? I see patients that are having an MI, they're in a heart attack. Cardiac output, right? Increase cardiac, cardiac output. So a, a laundry list. So you you do 
everything that you always do, you do a good assessment. All right. You you try to figure out the causes and then transport them. Okay. I mean, here's some of the, just the chart sort of to to look at. But uh, there's literally an an unknown number of things that can cause a syncopal episode. Now, you do everything, you do your good assessment, you protect their airway, you keep doing your good patient care, and you take this patient to the hospital where they get a battery of tests probably to figure out why they're having a syncopal episode. So the BLS wise, EMT wise is protect protect their airway, good AV, transport, transport them. He knows, you know, oh, I think this one time, even one time could be a problem. Episode to become complacent in your care, you just have to be very cautious. Now, you guys in the hospital, you're there in the hospital and you're standing all day or whatever, and uh, you pass out, more than likely, what's that from? You lost your knee. Then we make fun of you for a year because you have this syncopal episode. Them because they have another syncopal episode. Uh, signs of trauma. Make sure that we're doing a good assessment, good treatment, protecting their airway. Treat the signs and symptoms always. And it could, the syncopal episodes could be serious, but again, it's hard to say. Who knows? The, the doctor may find out. The doctor may never find out, too. You go to the hospital, get admitted in the hospital, they they're still, still may not ever find out why you, have these, you had these syncopal episodes. You just do. Sometimes you just have to. Live with it. Any anything, any questions?